Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Oh Yeah World Pod. Um, we've been, we haven't been around for a few months because we've been busy working and we couldn't get any guests. No, I'm only joking. Uh, but we've got a very special guest today. Um, I want to welcome Jabida Katun. Is that the. Yeah, Katun? that's fine. Katun, Katun. Yeah. Yeah. Who is uh, a director of a multi arts festival called um, Blackfest. And she's going to be my special guest today. We're going to be talking about her musical tastes, her musical history, and um, what music means to her today. Um, so, yeah, a little musical journey as usual. Um, of course, uh, if you want to find out more about our festival, Africa OYA, it's www.africaoya.com. And all the social media links will be available at the end of the show. But talking about the show, let's press on. Jabida. So, how Hi, are Paul. you? Hi, I'm okay. How Thank, are you? I'm good. Thank you so much for being my special guest this yeah. month. Thank and, you for having me, honestly. <laughs> um, so, uh, tell me about yourself. Tell me about Blackfest, first of all, for those who don't know. So, I'm Jabida. Um, I graduated in drama in 2009 and marriage brought me to Liverpool. Um, before that, I was a theatre maker, did lots of workshops, particularly drama-based practitioner. And then when I got to Liverpool, um, I was I was married. Um, and yeah, I just love the culture here. When you look at the amount of talent that's here. Um, I did bits of outreach while I was in Liverpool, predominantly North Liverpool. And then I took a little bit of a break. After my break, I decided to kind of go into further training after my university because sometimes with university, they don't really give you great pathways as to what opportunities there are and like commissions that are available to students. So my my degree was in performance arts, so it's in acting. And, and then um, I went on to an artistic director leadership programme, um, which gave me a lot of insight into the business side of arts as well. And it got me to really think about how do we galvanise together as a community and also bring more equality within the arts as well, because that was very, very important. Um, and through that programme, I actually met quite a few artistic directors and I kind of saw the kind of need that Liverpool um, kind of has to promote more diversity and um, artists of colour and black artists. Um, I started to meet them more so in 2018 because predominantly because my work was based in North Liverpool. I wasn't around a lot of the cultural diversity at that time. Um, so when I did kind of see the amount of talent that was available, I just thought, oh my gosh, like we need to do something about this. So then that's where Blackfest was birthed, you know. Um, and when did that start? It started in 2018, so it was a pilot. It was just a bunch of, it's just a few of us artists kind of thinking, how do we bring diversity, firstly, to Hope Street, actually, around the theatre areas. Um, and, you know, we just took over Fredericks, we took over Casa. And the other thing that was quite um, um, prevalent was that the artists that were coming into sort of, um, that I was getting into contact with through my networking was they were multidisciplinary. Like there was just so many spoken word artists, musicians, poets. There was um, lots of filmmakers. I was just thinking, wow, let's just combine this. Let's make something that's quite special for Liverpool and create this beautiful platform. And that's what 2018 was. Um, it only started small. And then by 2019, we were able to kind of pitch to our institutions and arts organisations and it was like, yeah, this is this is amazing. So we kind of, a lot of people kind of say to me, Blackfest just popped out of nowhere. Yeah. <laughs> but there was a journey. Um, and I actually was, through the Artistic Director Leadership Programme, I did actually meet a lot of artists through Unity Theatre. There was a, like a weekly meetup. And lots of artists were presenting their work. And I was like, wow, this we, we need to put this, we need to showcase this. Um, and that's where it started, 2018. So so what's your cultural heritage? Then? Where, where, so my cultural heritage is I'm Bangladeshi. So um, out of the three sort of um, Indian, Pakistani, I'm Bangladeshi. So it's the other side of India, East. used to be known as East Pakistan um, after partition um, in 1948 or 47. <laughs> so, yeah. And then um, we only got established, the our country, in 1971. Um, wow. But I was born here, like I was born here. I'm from Oldham, mm -hmm. from Greater Manchester. Okay. So I'm, I'm, I'm a Mancunian, obviously. Adopted okay. Scouser. So you're a Mancunian, um, South Asian uh, person running a, a, a black 
arts, multi arts festival. So yeah. how how does how does that go down? So, how, how do you get uh, what sort of reception? Do you know do you that from? that's an interesting question because we did start. I did start this. There was two initially, and then it became one. I think um, with with arts projects, I think it's important to sort of have. Um, well, I'll, I'll go back actually. I'll, I'll rewind a little bit. Um, in 2018, black was being used politically by the artists at that time. And to be quite honest, I was not aware of political blackness at that time. Um, I don't identify that way myself. Um, but um, at that time, there was a real kind of need and everybody was coming together. Like there wasn't, and I think now language is obviously changing and, and we're seeing a difference in, in the way the term black is seen across the UK. Um, but again, I think, you know, Blackfest is still amazing and we've always had like you know a diverse team we've always had you know black directors we've always had more people than myself but I suppose I'm very passionate about the platform so I think I've kind of gone through kind of really spearheading it and saying no this is something this this city needs and I think I think that's what it is it's not easy when you start a grassroots platform and keep up the momentum yeah. I think keeping up momentum as you know Paul, it's quite hard. Yeah, it's, it's not easy. Struggle. It's a struggle. Yeah, but keep at it. And and when is the festival? What what time of year does it take place? So the festival happens every end of September. Um, and yeah, so it's this year's 25th of September to the 1st of October. We've got amazing institutions involved. Um, we've got the Palm House, Unity Theatre, um, you know, Hope Street Theatre. We've got quite a few, but we've still got a few gaps here and there in venues, but we are, you know, like a full week of stuff going on. We also like to kind of have community venues as well. So we use like the Granby Winter Garden. So we always have like a community angle as well as the artist professional development angle as well with all the different segments. Um, the theatre segment, we usually now we're kind of moving on to bringing in touring pieces that are like kind of touring the UK with different themes. Um, and usually it is around, you know, um, diversity and equality and I think um, racial equality more than anything. So I think that's something that we do. We do. Okay, thank you for Explore. filling us all in on the wonderful work you're doing at Blackfest and, and I wish you every success in the future. But let's move on now and, and, and actually rewind um, and we're going to talk about your music and oh. your history of music. And it's going to be quite interesting for me because everybody that we get on here has a really different, um, diverse, uh, you know, take on music and, and where it came from in their in their lives and how, how it come. But let's start about when you were growing up uh, in Oldham, mm -hmm. in sunny Oldham, what was the music, the first music you can remember listening to at, at the youngest age? Do you know, um, around that time, because um, in Oldham, I grew up around my own diaspora. So it's a very big population of Bangladeshi community around me. Um, and we were really into Bollywood. Like, I listen to a lot of Bollywood. The usual kind of pop history, kind of pop music here and so, there. So did that, even though you was living in a predominantly um, Bangladeshi community, did um, that sort of music still cross over? Did the, the, the your peers, the youngsters, listen to pop music as well? Yeah, yeah, there was a lot of pop music. Like, we used to listen to a lot of the, ch you know... You, you know, like top of the pops at back and then, you know, that's that was our kind of um go to go to to for um music at that time. So anything from like, there was some kind of funny tracks as well, like Venga Boys and there was like a, another one, you know, um there was a lot of animation within Venga Boys, like going to Ibiza and um there was a lot of old school tracks as well, um, by like the Lighthouse family, um Lauren Hill. So so many all loads of other kind of amazing influences, Tupac and, and Biggie. Rap was a big, big, big um kind of uh, influence as well growing up because like Westwood, you know, if you remember Tim Westwood, um Trevor you know, um Trevor Nelson. Trevor Nelson. All of that was like kind of big for us. Um, you know, you kind of identify with that struggle of being in a sort of impoverished area and the lack of resources, education, as you know, Paul. So going to education, moving on to your school days, what was your what was the makeup of your school? 
in terms of the ethnicity? Was it diverse or was it, you know, them and us? Or was it, you know, one kind of uh, demographic? Do you know what? The demographic, again, like where I was... Um, was very like it was my demographic it was Bengali um, community a lot and I, and I think predominantly that's because of the cotton mills so um, like 1971 when um, you know the country was like established my, my, my father came and he took up work you know um, in the cotton mills and then a lot of kind of the ex-colony kind of countries at that time you know were kind of resourced by Britain at that time, you know, for our labour. So that's how the journey for the Bangladeshi community came to Oldham. So we came to Oldham. I think there's a few people in Bradford, Leeds, that way. So all those kind of cotton-rich mills, industrial um, economy, um, yeah, trades people and, um, sorry, labourers. Yeah, yeah. So that's how it was just a lot. And what happened was as well, I would say like, experiencing the fact that um, when our communities moved in, a lot of white families moved out and they just sold a shop and left, you know, and it just became bigger and bigger, you know. Um, our, our diaspora now, it's, it's, I think Oldham is actually known as the second Bangladesh almost. Mm. <laughs> and there's a lot of our diaspora. But is it, is it still segregated? Is it, is it, is it, have they been assimilated into the community over a number of years? Like you see, I've seen in London myself when this happened, you know, you'd see communities develop from uh, a new kind of community moving into that area. So instead of them just coming in and everybody running for their lives kind of yeah, stuff, yeah. They, they kind of assimilated and all of a sudden you had Tottenham where I'm from, which was predominantly, you know, a, a white or black area, then became Turkish and Greek and... Mm -hmm you know, Asian, South Asian, et cetera, et cetera. I think, it, I know what you're saying in terms of segregation. There is obviously bits of areas where there's like, it's Pakistani, there's lots of Pakistani community on one side. We've got the Bangladeshi on one side and then right into more of the suburban areas. Um, we've got the white communities and there is a bit of segregation, but then there's also some parts of it where there's, you know, a mixture as well. Um, but I hear what you're saying, like, Oldham is quite like, there's the Bangladesh community, there's the Pakistani community, there's this. So it is a bit like that. It is. Um, and, and we still come together somehow, you know. I can't speak for it now, but um, obviously back then, yeah. Yeah, so what kind of, kind of, going back to your school days, what sort of music was you listening to in school? Was it the same as what you were listening to growing up or did that kind of change now because you were surrounded by different people and got different influences? Yeah, school was amazing. I mean, um, we were surrounded by things like Destiny's Child and, you know, um, Eternal, TLC, uh, 112, D'Angelo, all the kind of that kind of music. And then even like college days, we'll be listening to like Mariah Carey, to 50 Cent, to Pharrell, to like loads of like the big, you know, numbers at that time. And, you know, um, there was a lot of garage influences like Craig David, um, Beyonce um, was also moving away from Destiny's Child at that time when I was going up from school through to um, kind of going into college So as that's well. a lot of uh, black music there. It was a lot. Of, you know what? That's like I said before, like it was part and parcel of like like identifying with, with um, like like I said, black culture. It's mm. just It's just amazing. On the other side, was did you get um, like you know, there, was, there was obviously the Brit pop scene, you know, Aces and Blur and all that sort of stuff. Or did you ever get um, did you ever listen to that sort of rock music? I or? did, I did, I did. Indeed. Oasis definitely, um, and oh, the songs in my head, but I can't remember the actual uh, artist now. And he's a big artist as well. Um, 
but yeah, definitely. I I was into sort of a lot during school. I also into the boy band. Like Five, like was my my kind of go to. That that was probably the first album I bought. Five. I know it's a bit embarrassing yeah. saying it now, but they did have a number one. <laughs> they had a couple of number ones. I think in school days, like you know, you can you can look back and laugh because. I'm the same. I come from the same age where Top of the Pops was the thing. You only had Top of the Pops, or you had um, yep. BBC Radio One, yep. and and that was it basically. So that almost like determined what you listened to yep. as a child. So you know, Culture Club and Duran Duran and all this sort of stuff. Yep. You know, you'd have people in my area listen to that because that's all we knew. Apart from the underground stuff, when we yeah. when we got home, you know, we'd have our reggae music that yeah. would come from our our. our uh, parents background so we, we always had that to, to yeah. sort of lean on as well I guess, well for, for, for us it was more Bollywood um, and it was like um, like a brim full of Asha you know like corner shop maybe, maybe you guys remember but yeah. you know all of those kind of big Bollywood you know songs as well that was into Bali Sagu there was lots of like at that time there was a lot of fusion between African and sort of um, you know R&B artists and also the um, Indian artists as well there's a lot of fusions happening as well when I was in school mm. Um Oh, there's one song. Um, oh, there's some songs that are in my in my head right now, but I just can't articulate them. Yeah, I mean, I think that I think that Asian uh, Asian music on BBC actually came about probably before One Extra, if I'm right, didn't it? Mm-hmm. They're doing the BBC Asian Network for a long yeah, time. Yeah, they're still going as well. Yeah, yeah. got an Asian network. Yeah. yeah. Um, so Asian music was kind of embraced um, by the mainstream and I knew it had a lot to do with the movies that came out that obviously you know people would hear and you'd have the the odd track that you know people you almost use it as a kind of an Asian soundtrack you know and that's cool but also I like the fact that people because of the internet age people would explore that more and, and find out you know more about Asian music yeah in the UK, um, any particular um, Asian music that you, uh, you we should look out for? Or that you like I said, Bali Sagu is probably a big artist that people will recognise him if you kind of like people do a quick Google. He does like lots of, you know, and there was like RDB, <laughs> RDB growing up in school. I don't know if anyone heard that, but there was like proper, you know, they were, they were, they were also trialling rap. <laughs> Sorry, Punjabi Surutanu made a loan. Janket to Hadi Apri Ranji, money balloon. Pyar for his sassy a car. Tadlo Shukri had a cardan side. Sorry, young, young uh, lads from Long Sai were doing like rap rap as well at that time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was like all those kind of... Um, yeah, the Asian Dub Foundation yeah, as well. That's yeah. another one I can remember. There was um, also daytimers as well for some of us that, you know, um, didn't go out in the evenings. You know, I was like, do you remember the daytimers? So they were like, like raves kind of raves thing, but in the in day. The day. <laughs> yeah. And they were packed, right? <laughs> they were really packed. Yeah. And what was the age group of the people that were going Do you know to what? Work? I think it was mixed. It was loads of uh, young people and, and, you know, older people. But yeah, yeah um, I think that was a way to kind of access, you know. Does that still out. happen now, do you know? I don't know. You know, I don't think, I think it's stopped. I think those things have stopped. I think um, people are becoming a bit more aware and, you know, a bit more, um, yeah, I suppose, um, you know, asking to go out in the evening and I think parents are being a bit more flexible and things like that. But I think we'll always have that in culture, innit, when you just worry about your young people, yeah, you course. know, 16 year olds like going yeah. out and, you know, and um, so I think it was more that. And I think it, it was just, again, it wasn't the same. So, you know, access to, you know, that kind of um, social gathering and culture um, only happened j- during the days and, you know, all of that. Um, so there was like daytimers, I remember. Um Obviously, the, the, the after parties in the evenings, they, you know, they was like, oh, we've got to get home now and that kind of thing. <laughs> but yeah. Daytime, as I forgot all about that they even existed, you know. Um, so uh, let's move on to, so you left school and you went to college, right? Yeah. Uh, was that in Oldham or I can't remember? Was Again, it in- Oldham, I actually did an advanced um, modern apprenticeship. So I chose to work and not actually go through mainstream education. It was like, um, so I did business administration 
Um, and I got up to about supervisory level by the age of 18, 19. Um, and then I did like part time, like studying in acting. Well, I actually wanted to do tap dancing and I ended up doing <laughs> acting instead. And then um, like my tutor was kind of like, oh, my gosh, like I've, I've not seen anybody like yourself in the acting industry. And I'm talking 2003 uh, and 2007. So it was like it was so new to him to see like diversity. So why didn't you pursue the acting I tried to actually, I'm not going to lie. There's probably a Birmingham film somewhere, Farsi film somewhere in Birmingham that I took part in. Um, I don't even know what it's called, to be honest. I did try. Um, what, after university. Did you find that uh, access wasn't great in those days? Access wasn't great. And like I said, universities just kind of say, oh, get yourself an agent. And that's not the only avenue. There's other yeah. avenues, you know, contact the theatres and see what commissions are available, you know, make a list of arts organisations. You know, they don't tell you all of that. And it was just get yourself an agent because you're an actor and that's what you're going to do. That's what you're going to pursue. Uh, join stage, um, you know, st st spotlight and things like that. Um, um, create a reel, you know, uh, and stuff like that. So I think, you know, there's so much more I think the universities could have done, like I said. Um, but yeah, myself, I did try. Um, but then it's like, you know, you have the balance of working and trying to pursue something. It was one of those things. And then it was like, um, yeah, my, my family were a bit like, you know, we should um, we should think about settling down. <laughs> so I ended up marrying a scouser. Um, so yeah, that's my story and how I ended up in, in Liverpool. And again, um, it, I did an arranged marriage, which yeah. a lot of people may may find quite like oh okay. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm 12 years married, so it obviously you know. works. In, it works. In, you know, not in all cases. Not but, in all cases. But it's definitely not as bad as what people kind of the perception that it's 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 given. Exactly, and I think because your families are tied, there's a different kind of commitment level. Yeah, you know, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. it's completely different. It's like you know, you know, you didn't make that choice by yourself. It's like yeah. there's so many people you've got to consider. And, yeah. But yeah, marriage isn't easy. Mm. But I think that you know. Um, it is something that I think is kind of a dying thing, isn't it, Paul? I, yeah. I just feel like people don't want to get married anymore. Mm. I don't know what it is. Yeah. But I've seen a lot of people just uh, are really afraid of commitment. Mm. Um, but back in our days, like, my sister got married at 18. So it's just like... I think, I, it personally, I mean, I'm married myself, but personally, I think that um, just the way people are nowadays, there are a lot more... It, I think when we were growing up, it's almost part of your life, which is yeah. your stages of your life, you know? get a job, meet get someone, married. get married, married, have children, not necessarily in that order, but, you know, get the house, you know, all that yeah. sort of stuff. And I really do think now, like, the kids of this age, the children of these generations, that's not kind of in their um, yeah. plan of action. And I'm not saying it's a good thing or a bad thing. I'm yeah. just saying times have changed and, yeah. you know, their priorities are, are different to what probably are. And that's down to your family values as well, yeah. you know. I think as parents, we're probably a little bit more lenient in traditions and, and the way things were. But let's not go back. Let's go back into the music. Let's go let's back into the music. Deep. One thing I wanted to ask you was have you, live music, any live concerts you can think of in your you know, in your life that stand out to you or are you not a big concert goer? You know, t tell me about that. Oh gosh, one of my concerts that I went to was in a Manchester University and it was um, Brand New Heavies. Oh, I saw them in Liverpool actually. Did you? Yeah, yeah, they were all cool. Because like later on I got into like Brand New Heavies, Loose Ends, a lot of like Motown, um, lots of like, you know, Aretha Franklin, Whitney, to, uh, uh, you know, Barry White, Anita Baker, Dina Carroll, like all of those kind of soul. I got into a lot of soul music growing up. Um, more old, like as I was getting um, in my mid twenties. So it sounds like your mature soul now <laughs> yeah. moved into. You've gone from your rebellious hip hop stage, and now you're going into your uh, into your uh, yeah. like your smooth soul. Yeah, and it was just like you know, it was such a revelation because I was like, oh my god, this whole amazing music that I didn't really know about, like um, Blues of Andros was like on repeat as well. It's lot. interesting that you've said. A lot of American soul, but also British soul. You mentioned in the likes of Brand New Heavies and Loose Ends. Loose who, Ends. You know, such an underrated group. This group yeah. was probably one of the only British soul bands that I can think of in in, in that period, which was like 80s, mm. that that broke America. They did. You know, and um, they were quality and, and, and made us proud as, as 
you know, I'm from London originally, as you know, but we, they made us really proud that they could go mm. over there and, and achieve such a big thing, you know. Mm. And then obviously Soul to Soul, um, yeah. you know. All Boys the stuff to Man as well. Yes, yeah, English, American, English American, American. English American, English yeah. American. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, um, so all of that was in my influences as well. I remember Faye Quay, is it, hold on. Finley Quay. Finley Quay. I knew Finley he was going to say that for some reason. Yeah, Finley Quay. He was, again, when you were saying British. Well, Finley Quay saying... actually played Africa O.J. in 2014. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, out of the blue, it just came and we just thought, what a great booking because, yeah. you know, he comes from an African heritage, but the music he plays was like, you know, the album, that particular album that he'd done, uh, I think it's called Maverick A Strike, was... You know, it was a seminal it was album, seminal album, you know. Yeah. Um, and, you know, whatever he'd done after that or before, no one can take that away from him ever. I wish I had an album like that, exactly. you know, that I could just sit on, you know. Even after all the murdering Even after all Suffering so You know I love you so You know I love you so and so I just remember giving it to my uni students and, and like some of my friends were like, Oh, you listen to such cool music. <laughs> yeah. But you know what music was cool? You know, I sound like a fogey because I'm sure, you know, when I was saying this music was cool. My parents were saying, what are you talking about? You know, but I do think um, there seems to be a lot more craft in the music of those days, whether it be whatever genre of music it was. It just seemed a little bit more, and I guess it's easier to make music. So I'm yeah. just being an old fogey. You do, you do your thing, young people. Yeah, you do you your know. thing. And I, but still, I think like when you go into a studio and the way people jam, the way genres were created before, like, you know, people just to, to jam different and mix different genres together and create a new genre altogether. I think that is still, you can't buy that kind of jamming and you can't buy that kind of... Um, yeah, just creations. I just think still these days, if you get artists together in one room, you'd get more. But you get, I think you do get that now, mm. but sometimes it's just a different scenario where people be jamming, you'll probably get, mm. you know, a producer and then you'll get maybe eight MCs mm. and they're all kind of doing MC jamming, if you like, <laughs> yeah. instead of jamming with uh, instruments, they're jamming with their voices. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, so yeah. I guess we've moved into a different world, but, you know, I am of the mind that, you know, even whatever type of music you're going to get into, it'd be. I think we should all encourage our children to at least have a got one instrument of some sort. You know, to give them like, yeah, you know, because you never know, man. Uh, they might love it. Yeah, I, I think that playing an instrument is so so important, and also it adds as an extra credit wherever you look. If you decide, if your child decides to go to America for a, for something or university or whatnot, having that extra credit of having playing a, a the cello or whatnot, I think is really, really important. Or, you know, another instrument, violin or the piano. I think we underestimate having that extracurricular activity, how important that is. And that's music. Um, yeah, I think when you look at class as well, I think, you know, a lot of big universities look for that, like, you know, can they play an instrument? Is that something they've got under their bag? Um, he has those extra credits. Is there is there enough access um, to to uh, instruments or for people from you know backgrounds that might not have the the resources? You know, most instruments. I remember I played the violin at school, and you know, I couldn't really continue with it because mm. to buy one for myself you know, at the time was like about a hundred pounds, and if yeah. you, you in the 80s, £100 was like a million pounds now to me. <laughs> yeah. um, so I couldn't really pursue it. And do you think there's still a a, a problem with access to, to that sort of um, I think to, to instruments? I think there is that access to, uh, to the instruments as well as, I think, more opportunities. Um, and I think um, structural um, kind of issues as well. 
in terms of accessing that type of um, world. Um, I think that that needs to change as well. Um, but yeah, definitely. I just remember having at least access to a keyboard and that was that was about it, you know, in terms of me growing up. Did you have music lessons at school? Or was there, was there music We lessons? did. I remember doing um, Stand By Me, you know, um, as one of our modules to, to do this. I don't know if it was encouraged a lot. And again, I don't know if it made a difference because I was in an all um, kind of my diaspora kind of, feel you know school where we were just messing around more than we were actually paying attention but um yeah I think that um there could be a, done, a lot more done for the music industry and young people accessing um you know like instruments and and I think supporting parents as well to, to kind of I think it's about education as well like I, I don't think there could be more like understanding about music and playing um, an instrument and seeing that as something very positive. Because, you know, when you look at our cultures, especially my culture, it's like become a doctor or an engineer or music and drama is not something that's encouraged as well. It's just like do the mainstream things that we feel is, is um, more it's attainable, like, you know, pharmacy, open a pharmacy or health or uh, um, the Bangladeshi community particularly we're doing opening restaurants and stuff so I think I think we just made things work and um, you know started up businesses but they they weren't ever like even now when I look at my own diaspora then th there isn't like mu you know music isn't so, so how does your diaspora perceive what you're doing I mean I asked you how the black community perceive but let's ask how you're diaspora perceive what you're doing did I see as, as oh my gosh doing? I mean they were really happy because obviously Blackfest became award winning I won was like one of the year um, and I think like honestly I've, I've received so much support not just from my own diaspora but there's so many people that are saying like carry on like it's an amazing platform um, you know there's still just so much need it, like, I can't even when I think about the amount of artists in Liverpool, it's just overwhelming. I'm sure you feel the same. We're not even close to to supporting and nerfing, um, you know, and encouraging the talent that's around at the moment. I, I know you just starting. Yeah. Yeah, it's starting, and I know as well in, within, within within yourself. Every day you're finding new artists for Africa, or yeah, from Liverpool, and it's like wow. And you know, most of the times the artists are making you know music in their bedrooms or writing poetry in their bedrooms. It's like how do we take that from the bedrooms and make this you know, attainable in a way, like pursuing it properly. And, you know, there's been lots of artists where we've, I've spoken to them personally, even writing poetry, and now they're everywhere. And I'm yeah. just like, yeah, that's it. Yeah. And they're taking up commissions, they're doing poetry, and it's it's been fabulous to just see their journey as well. And well, it makes it more worthwhile when we get that feedback as well. You know? Yeah, well, that's the plus point of what I was talking about before is, yes, uh, music is more easy to make and more, you know, people can do stuff on their own, which is the benefit, the benefit. isn't it? You're not at the, you know, whim of some record company or some A&R or someone who's got to put you on, you know. If you're good enough now, oh. you you can get on uh, just by so doing your own marketing and your own mm. uh, promotion, which is which is a, obviously a plus point. Yeah, it is a plus point. However, I do think there needs to be more um, unity as well in terms of how artists collaborate with each other. And sometimes I've seen some really good stuff happening now online where artists are kind of realising they're, they're good together. Do you know what I mean? Like there's, there's another new thing coming out soon and I've, I've seen like three artists join together and I'm just like, wow, that's great. And they called it Black Borough. There's just so many artists now, I think, independently, you know, organising themselves. And that's what I'm, I'm very excited about as well when I see that online. Yeah. <laughs> Southside, Liverpool, Scout Drive From when the clouds high, still in no silver line Winning with the red stripes, skinny dipping outside In the full flare with the words, got a feeling my syllables See I'm getting cheeky when I spit like Jigga do light skin with the white kids Call me Jigga boo, till I'm on a rhythm Bring a rock like with a dude Seven of truth in the booth, we get spiritual Welcome to my city, my name is Darky Strumming on the strings like old McCartney Feel the beat kicking like my Spatal's feet Usman on the hook, no rest, can't see like when I was young, didn't have a chance to black or a in Yeah, so the, this one's a really difficult question. And when I got asked this question in the pilot of this show, I was stumped because, like, you can imagine, like, I've just seen and had on and, you know, how can I whittle down? So the way I did it was I almost cheated and did, like, my ideal festival lineup <laughs> and sort of done a Friday and Saturday. But I, that made it worse because I then still left out loads of bands. So, yeah, this is an impossible task. So I'll ask you what your 
your five most memorable artists, and you can put that in any way you want in terms of memorable, but um, whether you've seen them live or you heard them or you li- used to listen to, but give me some, uh, you've mentioned some artists, some artists before, give me some more names that we can chew on. I think um, Sade for me was ultimate. I'm sorry. I just loved her growing up. And even like I, I bought her new Soldier of Love when she was she's still. I bought that. Did you? Yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I just like really, really loved Sade. Um, um, That's quite an underrated album as well. Is. Because like if you if you played like, um, you know, a Smooth Operator, or whatever that album was from back in the day, and then played Soldier of Love and played them together, you wouldn't kind of say, oh, that one's so much better than that one. Yeah. But I just think because there was such a time gap between the two albums like it almost went about unnoticed but I, I actually play some of the tracks yeah. in another time is one that I play off um, Soldier of Love quite often so yeah Sade unbelievable a London legend and you know someone who again cracked America like cracked said. America and cracked everywhere really people really? still yep. know who Sade is she's yeah. almost like one of those Kate Bush characters yeah where she's classical she's almost you like disappeared off the face of the earth <laughs> like she'll never disappear in term, terms of her her music mm. outputs, you know. I've lost the use of my heart But I'm still alive And, and when you go on holiday, there's always Sade playing somewhere, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Anywhere yeah. you go on holiday, Sade's yeah, yeah. there. It's just, <laughs> just like it's almost like just just <laughs> such cool, lovely music, man. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have to say Michael Jackson. Okay, because like he's the king of pop, and like there's just so many leaps and bounds that he made in the history of music. So much conscious. He tried to be conscious as well. All right, here's a better question then. What who, what was your favorite Michael Jackson? Oh, you can't era? do that to me. No, era. You can, an era. So, like, you can have like off the wall era or the thriller time. That's got to be the thriller time, isn't it? Because yeah, everybody was like round the, it's funny, like, round the TV I'm not, watching the. I'm not. I'm actually thriller. off the wall man because. Off the wall. Yeah, because that album to me, every track's a banger. I'm not saying it's not on thriller, but I think thriller was a little bit more poppy. And when he yeah. changed, and I'm not saying it was it was absolutely fabulous, and all the videos that went for, with it was groundbreaking. But but, but for pure music. I'm an off the wall man because there's some classic soul tracks on that that, you know, rock with you tracks like that off the wall, you know, just bangers, man. So that one for me, but yeah, I can see where you're coming from with Thriller for sure. Yeah, um, and I think um, like, I'm just going to mention some artists. It's not like they like they're the ultimate for me, but even like people like Desiree, I used to really really love her. Desiree, great. Um, you know, I just remember listening to a lot of her music, and then you had the Baz Luhrmanns, uh, Baz Luhrmanns, um, Romeo and Juliet come out, and you know she did such a beautiful number in there, and I was like, wow, just really wowed by her that she can just, cla- you know, move around from being a music artist and moving to movies and having that, and like when you look at things like Adele as well, you know, Tottenham um, girl. Yeah, again. I always big up Adele because from Tottenham. You see. I I do love to- Adele as well. Like I, I, just... say I do love Tottenham then. <laughs> 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 but um, even like Adele, like moving into sort of movies and and all of that, I think you know, the, you know, the music and the strength of where you can take it as well. Not just like music as its own thing. You can move it into movies and like it's a, it's across so many platforms and stuff. Like John, you know, areas of music and discipline. Blessed up, so you got your head in the clouds. You made a fool out of you, and boy, she's bringing you down. She made the hard mill, but she's cold to the core. Now, rumor has it, she ain't got your love anymore. Rumor has it, rumor, rumor has it, rumor, 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 rumor. I was going to ask you, I'm not going to delve too far away. I will come back to your top five, but I want to ask you about musicals. Does that play any part in yeah. you? Because I know that you've obviously performing arts background, musicals. You, you must have crossed paths. In Loads. Some way. Like yeah. I think the first musical I saw was called Cabaret, um, 
loved it. Had a really good kind of strong message as well, um, political message. And then Chicago, Guys and Dolls. Oh my gosh, I must have, I think, because I had a very great friend in university and she was like, Chibita, let's go and see this, let's go and see this. And I used to end up buying all the tickets and um, it's just people used to pay me back. But yeah, it was just, yeah. I, I used to just, I used to organise it with her. We used to see loads of uh, musicals. Um, and was, was that in Manchester? Was that it? was in Manchester mainly, yeah. Um, I've seen Cats as well. Um, so yeah, um, I've, I've loved all of the kind of, ones that we watched um chicago i love because there's so many badass women in there um, i feel it's quite feminist as well mm. chicago um yeah and cabaret as well um but those were some of the few that i i, I did i did see um okay. yeah kiss me kate um all the biggies then the basically. biggies basically yeah. um the biggies i didn't see see les mis Rollo came out a bit later I but then that. That was more like I saw it as a movie more, more than I did um, going to the well, theatre. I actually saw it at the theatre first, so it on. I didn't. I didn't like it as much on screen because I liked so, it at the oh. theatre. But I'm not a, a, a big musical fan. But the ones that I have seen would be Les Mis, Cats, um, Jersey Boys. And I saw a Motown one as well, yeah. um, but but not a plethora. You know, I'm not a massive fan because I haven't got the patience. Um, really, to to, <laughs> to uh, yeah. especially when I'm watching on telly, like when they, I watch it, and as soon as they start singing, I kind of zone out for some reason. Yo, yo, my men and my women, don't forget about the day. This is not the most the king, yo. Yeah, so let's go back to some of your favourite artists. I won't say top five because that's so restrictive. But I'm yeah. trying to give you a little guide. But so, tell me some more. Yeah, so um, I haven't mentioned Amy Winehouse because I used to love Amy Winehouse as well when I was in uni. Um, and also, um, yeah, Dion Warwick, Dina Carroll. There's, there's kind of loads of... So I'm trying to find a pattern, like with all these um, artists that you're throwing at me and there's obviously a lot of female, a lot of strong females oh, yeah, there. Yeah, so that definitely. must have, you know, you must have looked at those singers as kind of almost people that you want to kind of emulate in their strength and I do, yeah, I obviously just, not Amy yeah. Winehouse like in, sense of that, yeah, but in yeah. terms of her strength and her yeah. character and the way yeah. she came across and like Mary J Blige Lauren Hill you know these are like amazing female artists Missy Elliott, man. I've not mentioned Missy Elliott. I'm sorry. I just remember this vivid video when she was just like, <laughs> and just, do you remember that yeah, video? Yeah, yeah. It's just, she used to do outrageous things. Yeah, yeah. And I was just like, yes. She was so unapologetic as well. Yeah. Missy. Stop me now, listen to me now. I'm lasting 20 rounds, and if you want me, then come on, get me now. Is you with me now? Ashanti, honestly, there's like, yeah, I have to say, I love my female rappers, love my female. Um, and and the stuff. other pattern is, you know, they're either UK or <laughs> American. American, yeah. Yeah. Just, just um, yeah. Do you think that's because that was the state of our charts at the time? I think at that time, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, Obviously now we've got like Thames and um, again I think she's still UK based, isn't she? Or I Thames, you know Thames? No. Oh Thames, she's absolutely phenomenal. Um, I just I absolutely love Thames at the moment. You know she must be, must be from London with a name like that. Yeah. River Thames. <laughs> oh, I actually didn't actually make that connection. <laughs> no, I'm joking. But, like, I'm but just, you know, apologies to Thames out yeah. there. I'm not, I'm not dissing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but Thames definitely is like for me up and coming wise really great. I 
us at five in the morning. I wake up to five for my yearnings. Fear in my mind is a warning. Pray to the one you're relying. I've been wondering all day. I tried to be fine, but I can't be. I can't think of that many apart from, you know, like Nawanti and all these kind of, you know, typical songs that we're listening to at the moment. I, I'm just loving actually the surgence of African music. I was going to say, what do you think of the Afro beats? I love it. Yeah. Afro beats is absolutely amazing. And like the amount of DJs we've got in Liverpool, the, you know, we've got Afro dance as well in Liverpool. So it's like for me, it's like it, it's gorgeous to see them, you know, and and get them in the same place together and have it's a that very music. it's a very inclusive party kind of type vibe music and it, it's quite friendly you know there's a lot of music that come around yeah. and they're quite aggressive and you know almost <laughs> you know even though I like some of the music I couldn't program it because yeah. it just would create a, a not the atmosphere that I'm looking yeah. for you yeah. know I'm a, I'm about inclusive I'm about everybody enjoying themselves. Yeah. Um, Afro beats is upbeat. and Afro beat is like that. Yeah. It's kind of like every uh, Afro beats, should I say, yeah. uh, is like that. It's it's very happy dancing. Yeah. Let's have fun. It's upbeat, and I feel like even like young people, they the way they create these you you know unique dance styles with the yeah. accompanying those the silliness and um, yeah. I just, Do you know I what? It's crazy it. because dance was moving in that way as well. When I was in yeah. Jamaica, I saw exactly that kind of thing. The the parties that I went to. I was expecting them to be kind of hardcore, everyone vexed, you know, like a bit like, you know, people on edge, but it's not. It's almost like taking on that vibe of Afrobeats and it's yeah. about dance routines, everyone having a good time, yeah, yeah, yeah. less mis misogynistic lyrics, less homophobic lyrics, you know, yeah. it's a lot more, um, a lot more friendly. And I think that you'll find that dance hall will make that transition if it yeah. carries on in this way and, and, and there'll be more dance hall stuff going on in the UK yeah. as well. I actually haven't even mentioned like R Riri at this stage, you know, Rihanna and I just remember her back in the days, you know, when we would dance into um, Up on the Replay and, you know, all of that kind of. So it's great to see like how many artists that have really made it now as well, like big. Really yeah, so big. you feel like you've gone through like your I, own musical history today journey, and, and brought back some memories for you. You have. And it's like when I look back at the history of like what, what I used to listen to, I've always listened to the top 40s as well as try and look at also like going into like Motown and like it, no it might not be on like the four, top 40 now but I'm always open to exploring different types of music and I, I have such an eclectic taste as well mm -hmm. I think life is a bit like that you mm -hmm. know well yeah they say that don't they your musical taste kind of yeah. imitates what what you are like as a person you know so but one you're thing, very obviously multifaceted which, I am. you're running multi-arts um <laughs> Uh, festival, so that kind of goes hand in hand, doesn't yeah, it? Thank you so much, Paul. But also, like, I think you've highlighted something quite, um, quite prominent as actually, like, the amount of women I was listening to, like Dionne Warwick growing up, like, there were a lot of female, um, you know, even like Eternal, like, all these kind of TLC, like, all these kind of f strong female. That's the thing that stands out. They're all I women that kind of, like, whether they'll be, like, you know, the, the the girl bands that you mentioned, they all kind of had this kind of attitude about them, like we're running things. Yeah, <laughs> really, I don't know about you, isn't but it? it is. Yeah, they were, they were, and it's just it's phenomenal that we, we do have that kind of um, people to look up to in a sense, and like you know, um, you know the role models within within um, for young people to actually have a look at. You know, even in the past, even now, but even in the past, like I suppose nowadays it's Nicki Minaj or. Um, you know, things Cardi like B. Cardi B and all of that. Um, Lizzo, Lizzo's another one. Like, Lizzo's amazing. Um, her Brit Award, like, performance was out there, outrageous. Yeah, my daughter's going to see her soon. I mean, I don't know much about her. I've known a couple of songs, but yeah. Yeah. So even, like, my kids now, they'll be listening to, like, Ariana Grande and Lizzo. Even Lizzo, like, they're young, but it still infiltrates their kind of world in, in a way. Um, I think yeah. what we... We were talking about this the other day and we were saying that the the difference between when we were growing up and now, I think, is there's not really an underground. So, like, stuff like some of the stuff you mentioned before wouldn't be mainstream back in the day. It would be stuff that maybe only a couple of hundred of your mates are listening to and probably wouldn't even come out of the area. But now... With the with the internet and YouTube, you know, you can be a reluctant hero. You know, somebody could sort of sing a song and a friend can upload it and then all of a sudden you're getting two million views and, you know, yeah. you can be a reluctant hero, you know. This, this is how music has changed. Yeah. 
it has, it has. And the access to music has changed. The world of Spotify and, like you said, you know, just being able to put it up, upload it and create your own account very quickly. Um, but at the same time, like I said, there's still those barriers still there, you know, where the, you're accessing actual instruments. So there's still a lot of work that we, we do need to do within the music industry and constantly empower and, um, you know, and actually showcase some education about music. I think there's a film coming out this year um, about a very famous violinist. I don't know if you've seen it. That could have been me. <laughs> <laughs> if I had £100 to buy my violin. <laughs> oh, bless. But um, it was like, it's coming out this year, but it's like how he challenged the French and um, how some of his like work was even mentioned in um, big like um, composers, like, you know, operatic composers. Um, but he wasn't mentioned a lot, but he challenged a very like, a society that really needed to change then. I think it's just making young people now aware of these geniuses that was there in, in classical music as well. And I always find like, you know, when you do renditions, like operatic versions or renditions where people, young people can play around with arrangements, I think that as an opportunity would be great, you know, um, to sort of see um, that, that there's lots of possibilities. Um, yeah, that people don't get pigeonholed into just one type of music and just yeah. sort of say, oh, hang on a minute, you know, other people can, from diverse backgrounds, can like classical music and can want to learn classical uh, music. And, and, and rock and, like, to be honest, like, when you look at the roots of everything, even house music and all these other things, that we did do, like, programme, like, a house music, sort of um, Origins of House, like, research project, which is still kind of finalising in terms of the anthology. And there's lots out there as well about house music, but then it got turned, taken over by Madonna and U2, became more poppy. And um, But the roots were always, you know, African. You know, when you just look at, look at music in general, the influence of reggae, um, and all of that, and the sound systems, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and I think these things, these empowering stories will empower the young people um, in accessing music a little bit more. And again, like I said, the parents also supporting young people to access yeah. it as well. I as I always say, talent is everywhere, opportunity is not, and that's the narrative we've got to change. Yeah. And with that, I think we're going to leave it there, thank but you. I just want to thank you um, so much for appearing on the show. It's been a great to, to chat and to learn. And I hope it's been some nice therapy for you <laughs> as well. Gosh, yeah. Thank you, Paul. Thank you for having me, like I said. And um, yeah, I think um, it'd be great for people to really relive some of my, my moments of music. Um, but definitely keep listening to music. See what makes you feel happy in the morning. Like I said, Afrobeats keeps different moods and the feelings you get when you listen to music. It's, it is a real therapy. Um, and yeah, keep those the music in your life. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I uh, hope you enjoyed this edition. We'll be back with one more edition uh, in the next month or so. Um, be happy to hear your comments on the show and give us some feedback. And uh, we'll see you next time. We only said